My name is Kerry Battersby and I am Project Manager at Queensland Farmers Federation, specialising in risk, recovery and resilience programs for farmers. QFF is the united voice of intensive and irrigated agriculture in Queensland. It is a federation that represents the interests of peak state and national agriculture industry organisations. We engage in a broad range of economic, social, environmental and regional issues of strategic importance to the productivity, sustainability and growth of the agriculture sector. We develop policy ad and advocate on behalf of our industry members. On screen, if you can see that today, is some of the areas of policy and projects that QFF works on. Um, and you can see it's quite a broad scope, everything from water and energy policy through to at the bottom of the page. That's um, certainly the QFF team that is here today with you. Farm business planning, risk management and resilience building. This seminar today is funded by the Australian Government through the Future Drought Fund. If you are tuning in online, feel free to ask your questions in the chat section on the screen. Tim Barrett is here in the room with us and will ask them on your behalf. We'll have polls available throughout the presentations, which we encourage you to interact with. Feel free to reach out to Tim if you have any troubles online. Today, our intention is to outline expectations for the upcoming season for weather, finance and insurance. And thank you for your comments on registration about what you want to get out of this seminar and what is your biggest risk. There was a consistent number of responses to key risks being a lack of rainfall, international price fluctuations, contracts, grain prices, farm viability, cost of production, pricing of parametric insurance. Our speakers today can address most, if not all, of these issues for you. Now, QFF has a very effective arrangement with its research partners, University of Southern Queensland, and our insurance industry experts, Willis Towers Watson and Celsius Pro. We have here today Jonathan Barrett, the CEO of Celsius Pro, Russell Mehmet from Willis Towers Watson, and online today we'll have Professor Shabazz Mushtaq from UniSQ, our research partner, along with our very special guests, Andrew Edwards, Senior Markets Manager at the NAB, who is with us here at Stanthorpe. And online, we have Alastair Hawksford, Interim Stakeholder Engagement Manager, Flood Warning Infrastructure Network Program from the BOM, the Bureau of Meteorology. And later on in the panel today, we'll also be joined by Peter O'Reilly, CEO of this wonderful college, the Queensland College of Wine Tourism. In the room today, we have Sam Moore, who is a senior behavioural scientist from the Eviden team. Eviden is a behavioural science company that specialises in unravelling the challenges and opportunities facing farmers and how to work with communities to bring about a positive change. Sam is here working with us at the QFF team and is interested in talking to farmers and to advisors about experience of farm viability, finance and insurance, all the key risks and issues that you've identified. Now let's never underestimate the power of collaboration between government, university, research, ag industries and the commercial industry. It works and together for this project we are delivering good work for farmers. Now speaking of delivering good work for farmers, I'd like to introduce Vim Lindstrom the work that you do at the Stanthorpe Node as part of the Southern Queensland and Northern New South Wales Innovation Hub is especially important because of the unique characteristics of this particular region. Now, would you please welcome Vim to share more about the progress and success of the Stanthorpe Node. Thank you, Vim. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the introduction um, and thanks for giving me the, the five minutes uh, to, to talk about the Node. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledgement, uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land which meet today. Uh, I would also like to pay my respects to the elders, past and present. The Southern Queensland, uh, the Southern Queensland University-led Drought and Innovation Hub is one of eight uh, national drought resilience, adoption and innovation hubs, a flagship for the future drought fund. There are several nodes, um, Stanthorpe being one of them. Uh, the Southern 
Queens and Northern New South Wales Drought Innovation Hub operates from Dubbo to Longreach and east to the coast. Um, we focus on sharing information, building knowledge, facilitating innovation, and adoption of new technologies um, to build drought resilience and preparedness. As a note, I'm building on from a previous or last year where we had successful feral pig workshops, uh, dry season preparedness in Mangula, Tenterfield, Warwick. Um, we had some good diversification uh, discussions, great erosion, uh, erosion, <laughs> erosion events, uh, workshops done in Warwick, and a very well-received plastic paralysis uh, demo at the Stanthorpe Waste Treatment Facility. This year, I hope to kick off with a well-being event. This event is designed to help you, the participant, to identify signs of stress um, and how to respond to it. Uh, the event was designed at the request of various farmers and groups in response to difficult training environments for the farmers, as well as um, as well as some fires that were recently in this area. So, in collaboration with Track Rural Aid, Financial Rural Financial Services, and with support from the growers and elders, it's it should be a good event on the 9th of May in the Stanthorpe Showgrounds. I'm also working on so, uh, together with Southern Queens and Landscapes on funding uh, with funding from the Natural Resource Recovery Program. We'll be creating a soils and water expo with it, intent of providing information from trusted knowledge sources to to share sustainable practices in improved bare ground, soil hydration, land condition. And we're looking at exciting local speakers, but also bringing some respected leaders from further afield. This you know, we have a save the date for the 31st of May on that one. Uh, we've also last year we we noticed some good seedling response from Vermicast in um, tomato seedlings. So that farmer who was part of that project decided to plant 5,000 of these tomato seedlings um, further this year. So together with a with researchers from the University of Queensland who are working on a demonstration by adding FOGO compost alongside it. Um, we should have some workshops to follow and should be some interesting information for farmers. Another exciting uh, exciting program, I'm working with Farmers to Founders and their Tech Farm Initiative. It's a groundbreaking initiative to help primary producers identify on-farm challenges, uh, build capacity and accelerate adoption of ag tech that enhances drought resilience. Uh, more to follow, and I'll be talking to my community with that. I've got other workshops in the works. Uh, Gunda Windy, uh, I've got some precision agriculture I'm supporting locally. Collaboration with Growcom, we're hoping to get some resources out on, on some water banking, and I'm also trying to get UniSQ subject experts in front of farmers to share some knowledge. Other than that, helping with some grants in and around the area, and uh, if you look to collaborate or want to reach out, please don't hesitate to talk to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vim. Now, Alistair, you're online with us today. Um, you ready to tell us more about what we can expect in the uh, weather season for 2024? Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Al Hawksford, and um, I'm here today actually in my substantive role as the agriculture team leader here at the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, uh, and my sincere apologies, I couldn't be there in person today. Um, I've had a bug which really didn't want to share with everyone so I thought I'd do the uh, nice thing and um, uh, stay on this side of the screen um, but uh, look uh, I'm uh, I come off a of sheep uh, wine eucalyptus farms outside of Armadale and uh, uh, trained as a climatologist and uh, been lucky enough to lead the bureau's agriculture uh, side of the business for about the last seven years and um, uh, Look, it, it, this this is a, a big area of passion for me as well as uh, what I get to do day to day, which is great. And so today, look, I'll um I'll just share uh, a few few things today, um just to whet your appetite, I suppose, start the conversations. And first one I want to talk through is the lessons we learned from this summer just gone. Uh, then we'll have a look at the forecast for autumn. And uh, I'll just give uh, a couple of pointers on some tools and services that you can leverage. Just before we kick off, could I just get an idea of who's in the room? If you're a producer or grower or you provide on farm advice, 
Could you just hit the raise hand button or for those in the room, throw your hand in the air? Excellent, thank you. Very good, thank you. Um, uh, just help me to tailor a little bit about what, what I'm going through today. Okay, so um, let's start with the lessons learned. So I think the the what I want to get across here is that over the last three months, it's been a really good case study in some of the pitfalls of using uh, specific climate drivers as uh, the means by which you make decisions. Uh, so I'll, I'll focus specifically on Enzo. Uh, so um, th there was a lot of talk about a, a big El Nino and therefore uh, a drought and fire and brimstone, and um, uh, that didn't necessarily happen. So I just want to reflect on that as a way to for everyone to consider how this information can be used. So just looking back, we had um, uh, conditions throughout winter last year which were dry. And look, I'll focus in um, uh, the uh, eastern, uh, north and eastern part of New South Wales and uh, southern Queensland. And you can see it was, it really was a dry year up until the end of September uh, for rainfall. And we had high temperatures as well. So that evapotranspiration was really drawing the moisture out of the soil for that um, uh, you know, January to September period. So the, there's no doubt that uh, the conditions were dry and warm, which had people raising eyebrows about what summer would look like. Then we got into, um, this is the early spring, so August to October, and we had some really low uh, rainfall in that period. So lowest on record for vast tracts. Um, and uh, this uh, got everyone even more nervous uh, and resulted in what you see on screen here, some really low soil moisture profiles. Uh, and look, I mean, if you're on the ground, you didn't need any of this um, uh, information to tell you that. You just look out the window, it was dry. Um, and so folk were uh, already primed to be concerned. Then on top of that, um, these areas were also recently affected by really severe drought through 2017 to 2019 and had been flooded in between. So they really needed a good season to come through because they had those multiple um, uh, uh, you know, disasters uh, and so really needed a good return. So these, you can, I'm just painting this picture of there are a whole heap of things that were getting people nervous. And looking back to that 2017 to 2019, it was a similar picture where we had you know, lowest on record soil moistures in the same regions. Uh, and, um, you know, so yeah, I, I think made the point, it really was getting folk concerned. So we then had uh, a lot of focus in the media about El Nino. This is where things took a bit of a turn. So we've, we've had a, um, yes, it was true that there was uh, an El Nino in the forecast, uh, but the media really latched onto that and just went, right, well, it's gonna be strong, strongest ever El Nino, you see right there in the middle of the screen. Um, you know, really, really um, catastrophizing the impacts. They were saying, hey, look, this is, El Nino, so therefore it's definitely going to be really hot summer and really dry summer. And that's all we heard over and over and over. Now, the key point in here is that El Nino does not equal hot and dry. It is one element, just one piece of the puzzle that tilts it in that direction. It does not, it's not a proxy for. And, and this is the key point that I want to get across today. Um, if you haven't seen it before, this is a, a snapshot of all the different climate drivers that affects Australia's weather and climate. You can see there are a lot of them. And 
right up in this top right corner is El Nino La Nina. Yes, it is the biggest of those drivers, but there are so many other things that come into play which should actually affect the weather that you see on the ground. And whether you get the rain, what sort of rain, is it going to be drenching? Is it going to be just short and intense? Um, is it, um, you know, which direction is it going to come through from? Uh, so which parts of the region are you going to get hit? All of those come into play. And so it's really quite misleading to just think about El Nino, La Nina. But I'll, I'll, I'll put it in different terms here. It, not necessarily about the misleading side of things. If you're trying to make decisions on how you're going to, um, you know, protect your crop or your uh, stock, just focusing on one of these drivers leaves you exposed to a whole heap of uncertainty. So another reason that it's not a good idea just to focus on one of these drivers is that, well, here we go. It, once you start to understand how those work, you'll see that there's subtleties even within those drivers. So here's a, um, uh, a view of what El Nino can do to uh, rainfall um, uh, in that winter to spring period. And so it does have a big impact on winter spring rainfall. There's no doubt about that. And here's the evidence on screen. However, the summer rainfall next to naught in the part of the world that we're talking about today, it does not have a significant influence or has not in the past. And so this is another reason why the, um, the rhetoric that was going around was really hard for us to turn around and say, hey, actually, it's not necessarily all doom and gloom. Yes, we should uh, have our wits about us because it is already dry and therefore we need some serious moisture to bring us back to average and then go beyond that. However, there was a, a, a bit of hysteria in there about it definitely going to be hot and dry. Looking at the forecast, this is what the actual forecast had in it. So this was the November to January forecast at that time in October where we were saying, oh, geez, the, it, we're set up for a, a trouble, but what does the forecast look like? Now, these forecasts, they look at all of those climate drivers and everything else that hasn't been listed there. So these, they're called a dynamical model. It's the supercomputer, and they run these forecasts, and it takes everything into account. That's what you're seeing in these forecasts. And so the forecast itself, while there was a whole heap of doom and gloom in the media, forecast itself was, well, look, if, if anything, it's on the wetter side. And this image on the right, this is the chance that it was going to be unusually dry. So this is, this is what the media was really pushing about El Nino being hot and dry. And this is what the actual forecast was saying. Not a very high chance, you know, nil chance of, sorry, not nil chance, not a very high chance above average of those dry conditions coming to fruition. So there was a clear mismatch. Then if you start, there's, there's actually a whole heap of much more specific information that you can dive into. So I'll just, uh, I'll use this a bit in, in this discussion when we start to look at what's coming over the next few months. But if you had a look, uh, so this was a bit further west than Stanthorpe, uh, so down around Moree, Balata. Um, and if you look at these point specific locations, you can get a really clear view of what's going on. So here is the chance of it being significantly dry for November to January. And so dry is anything in these deciles or three, two and one. So we're, you know, really um, unusually dry is these deciles one and two. And it's the normal, what you'd expect is this dotted line. So if it's below the dotted line, there is a reduced chance of it being dry or unusually dry. And that's the case for both of these at that location. And you can see that summarized at the top, 19% chance where it's normally 20%. And in fact, there was actually 
a reasonable increase in the chance that it would be unusually wet. And so this is the type of detail that you can pull out of the uh, products that are online. And I will show you some more. So I think the, the key points I want to leave you with there is Enzo, El Nino, La Nina is not a long range forecast. It is just part of the information that the climatologists will use to help convey um, what is expected. So, so please, please think about that uh, when you're hearing that in the media in future. And there is a lot of talk about La Nina at the minute. Uh, so be wary of that. I will. I'll keep. I do see a hand up actually. I'll, I'll I'll take one question now, but feel free to type anything else in the chat, Sharon. Sharon, Sharon, if you can hear us, maybe just pop your question in the chat, and I'll get back to it at the end. All right, great. I'll I'll keep powering on. So let's actually have a look. What what are we looking like for autumn? And I will focus on Stanthorpe as an example. Um, and so let's just have a look through here. Okay, so here's the latest outlook uh, for autumn. Uh, and so uh, look for March to May. So what's on screen there is actually uh, next period. So what's that? April to June. Um, but uh, March to May, there is an increased chance there'll be below average rainfall for much of the country. Uh, and then if we look here, the, the next uh, period, so for April to June, uh, it's, it's less of a clearer uh, trend uh, either way. It, it looks like uh, if you were just using this map, you'd say, oh, look, well, there's probably uh, even odds that we'll get above or below median rainfall. Now, I'll walk you through the specifics when you dive into the forecast because that's not necessarily what this map tells you. Again, this is one of those um, uh, sort of products that can be misinterpreted. Um, it, it appears to be clear, but there's actually a lot behind it. So let's drill into the current forecast at San Stanthorpe. So you can do that uh, via the outlooks by either clicking on the map or you can type in your location. So, um, you know, and it'll pick anywhere on a 5K grid across the country. So, you know, there's information for your farm uh, right there at your fingertips. And it looks like this. Um, there's a few other bits and pieces, but these are the key ones that I wanted to point out. For April to June at Stanthorpe, uh, there is a reduced chance that it'll be unusually dry. So that's this decile one and two. And so and that's where it's saying there's a 15% chance that that will occur. So it's less than 81 mils. Then if we look across the other forecasts, uh, I think what this tells us is there isn't a lot of clarity either side of, um, you know, it's equal chances that it will be above or below average. But there is a, a slight depressed uh, chance of it either being unusually wet or unusually dry. So I'd say your odds are to be somewhere near average conditions. Um, so it's not a particularly clear forecast. Uh, sometimes you get really clear ones, where, it, and I will show you one in a tick for Stanthorpe. Um, but this one in particular, it's, it's a little bit of a hump, but look, I, I'd just be keeping a close eye on um, how this evolves. The other bit that I look at here is the confidence. So that's these stars here. And if you see a confidence that's two or three stars, um, uh, that's telling you in the past how many times has that forecast been correct. And so uh, if it's been correct more often than it's been wrong, then you'll get at least two stars. And you can hover over that and actually get a statistic to say, look, this has been right 66% of the time or um, uh, you know it'd be quite specific about that so that's a, a helpful guide the other one is this on the right you can actually see how the forecast is evolving with time so 
the dotted line is the um, most most likely um, outcome, but the range is provided so you can see how much uncertainty there is in the forecast. So for March, it's quite narrow. So you know, um, I think this the oh, and it's the tenth and the ninetieth in that box. I'm pretty sure. Percent off. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> Forgive me. I'd have to go double check. Um, but you can see that it is likely to be in this zone, not in the significantly dry, significant wet. Uh, and then you go out uh, with time and that increases. So punchline, rainfall looks to be about average, if anything, a slightly drier signal. And um, just to give you an idea about that confidence, th this is the map of that, um, how many times has these forecasts been correct? Uh, and so these are updated with every single uh, forecast that's done. And so you get, again, another indicator of whether you should be taking into this forecast into consideration. And so in this case, uh, the past accuracy is actually really good. Uh, so dark green, so it's been right at least, uh, what's that, at least two thirds of the time. So 65, 75% of the time it's been correct in this part of the world at this time for rainfall. So you'd have some confidence using that in your decision making. Thinking more about the impacts, uh, here's the soil moisture outlook. Uh, so this is out till May. Uh, and so with average uh, rainfall, no surprises uh, that uh, it looks like we'll have average soil moisture conditions as well. In the interest of time, I won't delve into that too much, but I suppose just to show that conditions are looking fairly normal with a couple of international models maybe suggesting slightly drier. The one I want to really point out, though, is that we do have a really clear signal on the maximum temperatures. And so uh, this is looking at April um, uh, at Stanthorpe. Uh, I particularly brought this out because there is still uh, some uh, apples and pears and other palm fruits that are exposed to um, um, sunburn. So any any temperatures above 32 degrees, you can get sunburn on your fruit. And so while this product doesn't tell you that, what it's, what it's telling you here is that there is a high chance of this decile 9 and 10, so unusually warm, so greater than 22 and a half degrees occurring for April. Now that's average temperatures across that whole month. So it's not a forecast of sunburn, but it is starting to give you an idea that look, the tide is rising, so any waves on top of that uh, could tip you over. So what I'm saying there is heat waves on an already um, elevated background temperature uh, could tip over into that 32 degrees. So keep an eye on the forecast for those. That's all I wanted to talk about with the forecast. And now I'll just uh, briefly zip you through some of the uh, tools and services which are at your hands to help um, get through uh, this content. And so um, uh, the first one I want to point out is we do have an agriculture decision support team. And um, the best way to get in touch with them is agriculture at bomb.gov.au. And um, uh, they're producing industry specific YouTube briefings right now. And so you, uh, I've got the QR code on the screen so you can go and have a look. Uh, but it's pretty easy to navigate to it if you go on YouTube, Bureau, Agriculture. And uh, there's a whole heap there. Now they are specific for grains, rice, and sugar, but there is some really great content in there anyway um, uh, so worth having a little poke around and what they're trying to do is provide you with um, a layman's uh, dis discussion about well here's what we're seeing and so you don't have to look at all the products yourself and try and work it out they're trying to communicate that in a clear way uh, through these briefings they're also doing in-person events so keep an eye out for them and um, Soon we'll be releasing releasing some train the trainer materials, which everyone can have a look at, and they're specific for grains, cotton, and rice. So essentially, here's how to do all the things that I've been talking about today, but in a nice, neat form online. So have a look out for them. It's it's great services. It's constantly evolving. Um, and for this group, I should say, I 
think Cotton, uh, th there's been talk about Cotton signing on for um, these specific um, services as well. The last thing I'll show you today is um, my climate view. So this is, if you want to put all of that um, longer term forecasting into perspective, you know, what does the decadal projection look like? What, it, what does it overall mean for businesses um, in your region? So we've created my climate view, which looks out a couple of decades, and that's um, in partnership with the Future Drought Fund, uh, who's uh, uh, the reason we're all here today. And um, so you can get for your location, again, on a five kilometre basis, so any farm across the country, uh, and information for 22 commodities. Now, I want to be clear that um, those commodities, as you see on the screen there, there'll be a whole heap in there where you go, well, pork, it's a, it's a shedded, shedded livestock. It's going to be a pretty good proxy for other shedded livestock as well. So try to think about what are the proxies there and you'll get a really good steer. The other one is that there's general info as well. So no damage going and having a look at the general info. So the two things I wanted to show you, just to give you a flavour. Um, so here is uh, for wine grapes um, at Stanthorpe. Here's the growing degree days and how that's going to change with time. So we've used a medium submission scenario. So this is um, uh, in short, if uh, society gets its act together um, and uh, starts to curb emissions, then this is what we could expect over the next couple of decades. Uh, but you can switch that to a less optimistic view with the RCP 8.5, that high emission scenario. We're currently tracking somewhere in the middle, just so, for clarity. So if you've got a high risk um, uh, sensitivity, then you might want to look at the high emission scenario. But as you see here, the growing degree days um, uh, are going up with time. And so you might expect that um, uh, we hit maturity a little bit earlier in the growing season for, for grapes. So that's something to think about um, as a longer term, what other implications might that have? And therefore, what do you need to look for in the long range forecast? The other one I wanted to point out, I mentioned sunburn before. Here's what sunburn at um, Stanthorpe looks like over the next few decades. And you'd see that there is a gradual increase of the number of days where um, sunburn conditions can be hit. Uh, and so, you know, two weeks or 14 individual sunburn days by the time we hit the 70s, uh, the 2070s, I should say. If you think your fruit is particularly robust and you said, no, nah, it's actually 34 degrees when it starts to burn, you can change that and you'll get a different profile. So I encourage you to go in and have a dig, play around with it. And um, yeah, there's some really good info there. Great, I won't take any more of your time, but as I said, I wanted to just plant a few seeds. And if you've got any questions, please, um, if we've got time, we can talk about them now. Uh, but if not, um, you can contact us in with that QR code in the middle or agriculture at bomb.gov.au. Uh, and on the right, you can see those two tools and services that I've uh, highlighted today, my climate view and the Ag Decision Support YouTube channel. So if we've got time for questions, I'm open for it. If not, thanks for your time. Questions on, any questions online? See Sharon, uh, had accidentally so. no. put her hand up. Okay. Thank you so much, Alastair. Any questions in the room? Take one question. That's all right. We've got Alastair's details, so you, I'll, I'll put you in at Alastair. We can email, all email you, can't we? <laughs> Absolutely. Go to agriculture. All right. Thank you, Alastair, for your time. You're, really you're appreciate fine. it. Hope you get right. well. Thank you. Appreciate and that. And we will move into our next speaker, who is in the room here at Stanthorpe, um, Andrew from. The NAB. Very pleased to have you here, Andrew. So good afternoon. Thank you for just bearing with us there another couple of minutes to get the technology sorted. So um, again, appreciate the invitation and opportunity to have a conversation this afternoon. Um, I'm Andrew Edwards from the National Australia Bank, based in Brisbane. Um, I cover all of Queensland in a 
a uh, particular part of the bank, the financial markets part. So what is that? That means um, looking after customers in terms of their risks around financial risk, right? So again, it's not insurance, but it's um, interest rate risk, commodity risk, uh, foreign exchange risk in particular. So dealing with, I'm not going to talk too much about products today, um, more so just a bit of an update as to where the economy is. Um, again, generally more broadly, again, across Australia, but also what's influencing things from overseas. Um, and we'll go from there. If obviously there's any questions, feel free to chime in. Um, I'll take questions at the end. About 15 and 20 minutes, I do use a few slides to sort of help explain a few things. So I will sort of whiz through them pretty quickly, but um, yeah, as I said, most importantly, it's pretty open. Feel free to jump in and, and um, ask some questions. Um, where will I start? Look, I think the first thing I'll start with when we're talking about the economy is just around inflation. Um, again, for mum and dad, that is obviously the cost of living. So that's obviously in the media pretty much all every day. It's it's obviously what's driven um, you know, the big change in interest rates in particular over the last 18 months. So where are we at with inflation? The, um, I guess, you know, the, the good story or the um, the positive is that it's heading in the right direction, um, obviously from the highs that we've seen. So when you look at inflation, there's a few measures. The most important one is called the, well, the core inflation, which takes sort of tops and tails the, the, the volatile items. Top left-hand box there, you can see trimmed uh, mean inflation, which shows inflation at 4.2% in Australia. And again, it sort of shows where it's been to over the last 30 years and why the RBA was pretty keen to lift rates and slow down inflation. Uh, when you look at the top right, again, contributions to that, it has varied a little bit, obviously coming out of COVID. I guess in a nutshell, the, the reason why inflation got a good start was because there was um, you know, supply disruption, right? So there's a lot of money chasing not many goods, so that creates inflation. Uh, more recent times, that's sort of come back a little bit. So there's actually been, uh, in terms of goods, so you think about a physical product, goods-wise, those supply chains have opened up. Um, demand has softened a little bit around the globe, so then obviously prices have stabilised. It's the part of the economy that still, you know, I guess, has some inflation, is a little bit sticky, is actually the services side of the economy, right? So when you think about inflation, you, you probably think of buying a physical product, but it's the things like going to get your haircut, going to the doctor, those services are where the inflation is at the moment. That's that's still, I guess, uh, uh, something that the RBA is very keen to keep an eye on um, because it is a little bit sticky, right? The the key driver, the key cost for a lot of those businesses is wages, right? It's true service business. So when wages are rising, well, then their cost base is increasing. That's going to keep that stick of wages moving. Uh, the only, I guess, point as well, point on that chart is on the, the left there, bottom left, you sort of see some, a lot of squiggly lines, a lot of different countries and the inflation data there over the recent times all had a big spike coming out of COVID. The US led the charge pretty early. Um, Australia was was a little bit below everywhere else, right? So again, um, on the downside, we also have periods that inflation is taking a while to come down. So we're sort of lagging everywhere else. So if you're hearing about rate cuts in the US or somewhere similar, it's probably because their inflation has come under control a little more quicker than here in Australia. I'll keep moving. Um, the other key one is obviously, as it always is, the employment situation is still very tight. Um, Roll back 12 months ago, particularly at the end of COVID, as the markets were, you know, economies were back open, business was crying out for labour, couldn't find labour, right? And again, the cost of that. So, um, no surprise, the unemployment rate at the time was about 3.5%, never been lower um, on, in terms of what's been reported at. Today, basically 4.1%. So, it has risen from the lows, uh, you know, from those 3.5%. But, you know, again, I guess you look at What's happened in the economy, we've had 400 basis points of increase in interest rates, really hasn't changed the needle too much in terms of the employment situation. So it's still a very tight labour market. Um, again, you would expect that to slow down a little bit, but again, it, that's been a key driver of why the economy has been fairly resilient. Mum and dad still got a job, they can still probably find another one tomorrow. That, that's kept, kept things moving along, despite the fact that interest rates have been increased pretty significantly. There is a little bit of a data, data sort of, I guess, anomaly there over the Christmas New Year period. So we'll just wait and see as to what the trend is. Um, has picked up a little bit the unemployment rate, but to move um, over the next six to 12 months, probably move a little bit higher again. And again, a little bit softer. I wouldn't say it's pulling off a cliff. Left and right hand panels on the left there is inflation forecasts for NAB and the RBA on the right, see unemployment rate. So when you're looking at the left hand panel, inflation has a good rate band there, two to three percent. So that is basically the RBA's preferred sort of target, uh, that's where they would like it to live. It's obviously well out of that at the moment. 
So it will take a little bit of time before it even gets back to where the Reserve Bank wants to see inflation, likely sort of towards the back end of next year. The unemployment rate on the right, yeah, again, we NAB and also the RBA have similar sort of forecasts as to where we think the unemployment rate's going to move to. Um, if you look forward to sort of 2025, 2026, the unemployment rate somewhere around about 4.5%. So, again, a little bit higher than where we are today, but again, broadly speaking, if you're looking at that from a long term perspective, it's still well below even where it was before COVID. So, still a relatively good good um, story there around the, the jobs situation. Again, obviously, if the RBA says they tick up faster than expected, that's when they'll have to move on the, on the catch rate. Economic growth is, uh, again, reported as recently as last week, if I've got all my weeks right, um, it came in at 0.2% for the quarter. So that's as probably, as, as you know, obviously 0.2 is pretty close, to, pretty close to negative. If you actually look at it from a per capita, strip out all the, you know, the population growth that we've had, you'd probably argue the quarter we just lived through at the back end of last year was, was recessionary almost. So pretty, pretty weak growth. Um, Again, our view is we're probably somewhere near the bottom of that, though. We're sort of coming out of it at the back end of this year as real waivers sort of continue to improve as inflation comes under control. Um, what's contributed to that growth more recently? Um, the government um, spending. That's, that's, to be honest, has kept things ticking along. And obviously, um, from the export side of things and some investment. But if you're looking at mum and dad, again, household spending, it's it's been... Now, not terrible, but it is pretty weak. And again, you probably would have expected that given what's happened with the cost of living and, and in the interest rate rises that we've seen. Um, wages, again, we're looking at wages again because it feeds back into that inflation. Okay, So again, wages are uh, roughly around, reporting at the moment, around that sort of low 4% per annum figure. And that's been driven not only by private sector um, jobs growth and uh, wages growth, but also some of the collective bargaining, the minimum award wage changes that went through last year. And on a sector basis, it's those services sectors, which I mentioned before, healthcare, education, some of those big big employment sectors um, are actually recording some of the bigger numbers in terms of wages growth. So with wages up around 4.2%, if that continues broadly, and obviously if inflation comes back to three, then you've actually got some real wages growth, uh, which was obviously why we start to think that, you know, the economy's from a growth perspective Positive at the moment, but bubbling along pretty pretty flatly until next year. What's helping out with the economy, as I, as I did say before, as well as being population. So um, on the left hand side here, it's sort of showing the stories of what the the Australian population should have looked like, broadly speaking, before if we didn't have COVID or pandemic, um, and what it looks like today, right? Which is the red line. So we've almost made up for what we were we probably lost from COVID. And that's obviously in the last 12, 18 months, a big push in terms of employment migration. I think last I read was about 600,000 people have moved to Australia. So if in the last 12 months. So again, that has spiked with obviously the reintroduction of, um, of, of you know, of the borders being open and um, in particular students. Locally on the right hand side here, it's obviously a good sort of Queensland as well. So again, um, people living in lockdown situations in Melbourne, et cetera, Want to get out, move to somewhere a little bit more um, friendlier in terms of um, cost of living as well, in terms of housing. Queensland's been a massive benefactor of that. And again, probably similar story if I had Western Australia up there as well, right? So um, you can see there that that's, that's now for supportive of what's been playing out, particularly in housing. Um, probably have a whole session about house prices, but again, Gas prices are bobbing again, and again, you've got supply demand issues. There's a lot in the media, a lot, a lot of politicians talking about it. Um, obviously, the migration story, a lot of people moving to Australia. There's construction costs still that are significantly rising and still high. Um, so there's obviously still strong demand for housing. And with the housing approval data still well below population growth, you can probably argue there's still a little bit of upside still with, with housing despite um, interest rates being where they are, and you know, borrowing power still fairly limited to compared compared to where it was a few years ago. Looking at other factors within the economy, which I sometimes don't get a lot of news, um, is is some of the stuff we look at around, um, I guess, mum and dad balance sheet around Australia. What this chart here is is basically a, an amalgamation, if you want to think about it, of the banking system that's done by APRA and reported, and it shows. 
uh, I guess, household deposits in particular. And it shows, I guess, a pretty, strong, a pretty good story there around, despite the fact we've gone through COVID and then we've had the, the increase in interest rates, mum and dad basically stoved away a lot of money. So if you look at the trend lines there from when COVID started, and then if you look at what's actually played out for households, households in effect have put away an extra $260 billion in Australia in the banking system. So again, incomes, again, from a real income perspective, have been hurt, obviously, because of inflation. Interest rates have gone up. A lot of, obviously, mums and dads have potentially, rather than spend that money on discretionary items, put it away, put it against offsets, put it into banks. And again, there's a bit of buffer there in the system. So from a wealth perspective, um, it, it gives us a bit of buffer. So in the event there is a some some volatile um, a pandemic or another situation arises, there is some balance sheet support there out there in the economy. I'll keep moving. Um, one other, I guess, chart that I have, have used, and again, it's, I guess, goes to basing decisions like we talked about in the last session around forecasts, is that they can always go a little bit um, a bit more different than what's planned. On the left here is is a spot in time. It's June 2017. Uh, what is it? It's basically three lines. The blue line is basically the market at the time. So going back to June 2017, the market expectations off to where uh, interest rates were going to move to, okay? Or into bank money, right? The, the, the grey line at the time was what NAB's forecasts were, and the yellow line is actually what played out, right? So COVID came along, changed things pretty significantly around interest rates. Right-hand side is similar storage, June 2020, though. So we're going to sort of just around middle of um, 2021 COVID was, you know, all around the world. And the grey line, the blue line, again, forecasts from the market and NAB around what was going to happen with interest rates. The, the orange line was the RBA telling everyone rates weren't going to go up for three years. The yellow line is actually what played out. So, again, we're talking about risk, just being mindful that there are always, you know, volatile uh, markets and environments to be aware of um, and obviously just basing things on a forecast and, and obviously use some, use some buffer whenever you're making you know, important decisions. Globally, again, if we're talking about the economies, uh, where they're going to go to over the next six to 12 months, there's obviously some important elections that are happening. One is in the US. Um, this is, I think, from roughly the end of February. This in front of you is basically showing where things are in the US. Um, you know, it, and again, as more recently as a couple of days, I read something that suggested I think nine of the important states in the US election, I think Trump seems to be ahead in eight of them. So, again, what does that mean? Um, obviously, that does mean obviously business is probably supportive, but then what does that mean for, you know, things like inflation if you know, Trump's talking about putting 60% you know, tariffs on China and, and other things he's sort of suggesting. So, you know, that's all going to play out. These are some of the things that might be the curveballs that would come in that could change things pretty quickly. And I guess from Australia's perspective, obviously China's fairly important, particularly from an export point of view. Again, some headwinds in China um, and some structural things there that are playing out as well. On the left, China's population is now shrinking. So um, again, their one-child policy for many years is starting to obviously have an impact. Um, on the right-hand side, you can sort of see even in some recent times, direct investment in China is now starting to wane a little as well. So what does that mean for China? China's, China's economic growth story, again, they're pointing for 5% growth. Um, will they achieve that? When they say it, they generally do. But again, it's well off what, the, what we were used to you know, a good decade ago. So what does that mean for our export economy, particularly um, for agriculture as well? So uh, and not just mine. So then how does that all feed into what, what the RBA may do? Right? So what does it actually mean to the average business? Um, this chart here shows the RBA cash rate to the red line, uh, and the hard red line, I should say, and the other other lines there, the blue line. So this is basically what the end market expectation was for the cash rate going back three months ago. So if we were out here having this conversation three months ago, we would have told you that the market was still pricing in a chance of one or two more rate rises. Okay. Now again, some of the inflation data that's come in has been a little bit softer and a little bit better than expected, um, which has definitely helped with that, right? And that's why now you look at the black line. Um, that's what the market pricing is at the moment. So I'm not here to say that the cash rate is going to go back to anywhere near it was during COVID, but if 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 the market is 100% spot on, then the cash rate, which is at 4.35% today, if you're looking for the next 12 to 18 months, 
you might expect two or three more, two or three rate cuts. So, you know, 0.5 to 0.75% is sort of what the market is already pricing in today. Okay. Um, the red line, the red dash line is NAB's view, and NAB has a view that cash rate will first move in November of this year. So, again, RBA to still get some more information coming through around inflation, how the economy is sort of dealing with that. And obviously, that pretty conservative as usual. They'll probably want to see that inflation number down to somewhere closer to three before they have to move the cash rate. They've probably got a little bit of time up their sleeve if the unemployment rate stays pretty low. Um, but we do think that obviously the RBA will have to start to move rates lower at the end of this year um, and again into next year. So again, other banks have a pretty similar view. And again, you're sort of getting that cash rate back to somewhere around the low three. So it's roughly 1% lower than where it is today. Okay. So that's again 12 to 18 months though. It's more of a 2025 calendar year story. How does that compare to around the world? Um, up here we have the RBA cash rate again, and in terms of expectation and fork market pricing. Again, the RBA is not expected to cut too much relative to some of our advanced economy opinions. The US is likely, if we look at pricing, to cut somewhere closer to the middle of this year. Um, and, and by the end of this year, the market is expecting three rate cuts in the US. Um, if, I, if we were having this discussion back in sort of just after Christmas, the market was pretty, pretty, you know, pretty excited about the US having about six rate cuts though during the course of this year. So some of that expectation has been unwound a little, um, just on the basis of the US economy is still being relatively resilient. Globally, for this year, um, if you look at the charts, it sort of sets out economic growth what it has done and what 2024 looks like. If you go straight to the bottom there, 2.7% global growth. If you take out COVID and if you take out the GFC, that's basically the worst economic growth in about 25 years. So again, it's 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 a pretty, 2024 is obviously the year where all those interest rate increases and inflation is catching up a little, and hence why most of those economies probably have to start cutting rates at some stage later this year, particularly Europe. And yeah, you know, UK's in recession already. Um, 2025, though, you can sort of see there that as much as it's not, you know, significant growth, we are pointing towards a bit of an improvement over time. NAB's forecasts are all here. Um, again, there's a lot of detail there. Um, broadly speaking, as I mentioned before, the cash rate at the bottom there should be lower um, by, by late this year. And again, November, Melbourne Cup Day typically is when they cut. Reserve Bank, though, has changed their, their the way that they announce them. There's actually an RBA announcement next week. They usually do it the first Tuesday of every month. So it's now in six weekly cycles. Uh, and obviously, the Aussie at the bottom there, which I'll move to at the moment. So Aussie dollar wise, um, we're sort of trading just for when I looked this morning, just below 66. So if you're looking at where that lands historically, which is on the right hand panel here, percentage of time in each bucket since the Aussie dollar floated in 1983, when the Aussie's in 65 to 70 cent range, 15% of the time it's usually in that range. So we're sort of, as a currency, we're sort of sit between 65 and 80 nearly all of the time, as you're probably well aware. Um, we're sort of in that zone at the moment, probably heading back up towards 70 as the year sort of progresses. So our view is by the end of this calendar year, the Aussie dollar should be somewhere around 70, 72 cents. So again, part of that story is the fact that the US is likely to start cutting rates before we do, and probably more significantly than we do. All about interest rate differentials. Okay. Again, in the background, though, you still have that China influence, particularly for Australia. So, again, keeping an eye on China and obviously, you know, if Donald Trump or, you know, what happens with the result of some, some elections. Uh, I'll keep moving for time's sake. There's a lot of other currencies there which I can sort of send around if you want to have a look at anything. I guess specific, we talk to exporters all day, every day, and come up with products that, that enable us to sort of hedge all this risk. Um, so, if, you know, if you've got interest rate risk, currency risk, body risk as well, which although I didn't touch on, there are products we use to, you know, wheat swaps and a few different things which some people may be aware of. I'll leave it at that. Again, that's all, as I should say at the front of this, disclaimer-wise, not personal advice. So, again, if there's any questions, please feel free to touch base or talk to someone else as well. Um, any questions at all, we can leave it at that. I've got a question. Andrew, with the tightness with, uh, uh, with wage growth and the tightness in the, as wages are important component in CPI, with the tightness in the um, getting the employment, do you think that's going to force the RBA to keep interest rates higher? Potentially, yeah. yeah. So again, you know, if you look at data around the world, the unemployment rate has 
held up very, very well. So even in the US, you know, they, their cash rate got to 5.5%, you know, it's higher than where it is here in Australia, and employment rates barely budged. So, you know, if the unemployment rate stays where it is and the employment situation is pretty tight, leads to that ongoing sort of wages, then there's probably less likelihood that the Reserve Bank's going to be too friendly about reducing rates. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, again, on the flip side of that, though, if we see that unemployment rate start to, to, to move a little bit higher, a little bit more quicker than what the RBA expects. So they're probably thinking the unemployment rate will get to 4.5% in the next 12 to 18 months, if, it, if it's at 5%, or looking like it's going to go that way. Mm-hmm. That's when they'll probably pull the lever a little bit earlier on, on reducing interest rates. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Andrew. So our next speaker today is here with us in Stanthorpe. It's uh, Jonathan Barrett from CEO of Celsius Pro. Jonathan, thank you. Okay, thanks, Kerry, for that. And um, yeah, welcome everyone. It's uh, I always think it's nice to be able to hear at the beginning of every season, you know, what everyone's thinking about, what the weather's doing, um, what the economy's doing, and and really to get a get a sense of um, how we can start to plan. Um, you know, I think really it's very hard for everybody uh, or even the experts to suggest where markets will go, what interest rates will do or what the weather will do. So I guess where we come into it is if you can't predict it, then try and hedge it, try and hedge your risk somewhere. Um, particularly when we're talking, you know, obviously a lot of producers, there's a lot of risk on the table. Um, you know, when you look at a, a farm balance sheet, you can see that you know, that uh, there was debt on the table and interest rates are going to affect that. Um, when you look at it in terms of the weather, you're about to put a new crop in and you're worried about what's going to happen in terms of the weather. Um, so let's say that. So I guess our view, or uh, yeah. yeah, got it, okay. Thanks to the Future Drought Fund, we've been doing a lot of research into insurance, um, a lot of innovations occurring, a lot of testing, so we can make sure that the balance sheet or the movements on the balance sheet can be, um, I guess, less volatile. Uh, in farming, we tend to look at ourselves at about a seven year um, cycle where there's some good years and some bad years. What we looked at is, is innovation um, using a type of insurance, parametric insurance, which we will go through. But essentially the whole idea is to smooth your balance sheet, um, you know, make sure that sort of Andrew's comfortable with it, your loan book, make sure that you're, you're comfortable with your income, make sure you're not going to get that volatility. So we feel insurance um, certainly has a play. Uh, there was a National Farmers Federation survey done in 2019, and it basically said to us that um, you know, production risk was one of the most important things, 56%. 80% of farmers uh, rate drought as the single risk to sustainability. If we can control what or how we can manage whether it's uh, on farm, whether it's adaptation, or, or whether it's uh, an insurance product like a parametric product, if we can control what we actually think about how we can control drought, then that eases a lot of pressure on our balance sheet. Seventy-one percent of farmers take on more debt in bad years as well. You know, hoping that in the good years um, it'll be all right. But then again, when you really think about it, particularly up around Stanthorpe in this area, we had drought for seven years. You know, so you think about it, it's all about trying to manage these expectations. And that feeds just not from what produces on the farm, it feeds right through to the community as well. So if we've got a means to be able to spread the word in how we are going to manage this risk, then the better off is for the community as a whole. And then 68% of farmers um, said they're prepared to give up something to get $250 a hectare back. It's quite interesting. Interesting when you look at it, because when you look at the risk that the grower has, we often say, particularly in Broadacre, they're spending 300 bucks to make $900. How do we get those inputs back? You know, when these events occur, are we safeguarding the ability for us to be able to get some income to start things off again? Parametric products are one means. And we've got farm adaptation methods, could be more dams, all these sorts of things all make effort. They all make something that we can we can use. Um, so it's having that in your quiver, these little products to pull out when you need them. So, what have we been doing about it? Okay. FDF Future Draft Fund Fund has allowed us to uh, work an appropriate insurance product to insure against yield loss. 
Um, this is sort of a, a pet project which I like because we're actually wrapping insurance around how the plant behaves, how the plant behaves to, to weather events. And to me, it's sort of doing that sort of study, and I've got a couple of examples about making um, structures appropriate to the risk. And as we look at it in some cases, and one of the classics I like is that uh, with canola, canola, we lose 3%. Uh, 3% for every degree over 28%, 3% of yield um, when we get a, a heat day, anything over 28 degrees. So if you get a prolonged heat wave coming through, then you're certainly losing a lot of yield, and that's a lot of income. So we wrap these insurance products, we understand how the plant behaves, and then we put a product around it. We build an understanding of the willingness to buy, and, and I guess through the Future Drought Fund, we're having conversations with growers, we're having conversations with reinsurers. So we're on both sides of the fence, trying to understand what someone will charge for risk and what someone will, will is happy to pay for the risk. And, and to me, that's one of the most important things because that creates that market. And it always creates that involvement in the market that enables these products to continue. We feel that parametric insurance offers that kind of scope to hedge production risk, seasonal risk, specific event-driven risk, um, and uh, a likely quality downgrade. All these little areas sort of can be catastrophic risk or they can just sort of like stop you maximising your return. A classic of that is a wet harvest. You know, when we look at a, a, a broad acre, uh, if we're looking at wheat, for instance, you know, if we get a, a bit of rain around a three-week period, that could be the anywhere between 30 and 50% downgrade. So that then sort of has to, you have to refocus and say, well, that three week window actually cost me a lot of money, a lot of money that I could have hedged. And that also increases my ability for sustainability uh, in, in, in what we're doing. So what is a parametric insurance? And I think this is the, the beauty of it. It's, it's, it's basically a, a cover, it's a non-indemnity cover. There are two types of insurances. One is indemnity, one is non-indemnity. Indemnity means you have to have proof of loss to show. Non-indemnity means that if the triggers occur, you get paid. Some of our farmers say hey, that's gambling. But I always say when you put a seed in the ground, you gamble. You know, we're trying to understand what the weather actually does and how that will affect. So we design products around it. With a parametric product, there's no proof of losses required. No excess needs to be paid and payouts are automatic once the policy is triggered. This creates efficiency. And the important thing about it is when you have that extreme weather event, you get paid if, it's from a, if, the, uh, if the policy triggers are based on a weather station, you get paid within five days. What does that mean? It means you've got money that comes back straight in, money come back in to rebuild what you've lost, to maybe build a new dam, create new inputs. So in terms of that, it's the importance. The important thing is being able to get money to the spot where it's needed the most. And this is where a parametric insurance product helps. The good thing is we can tailor to any crop. Um, we did a lot of work, and, and Brooke would know, we did a lot of work up in the pineapple land. And we started to understand, talking to the growers, what happens to pineapples? You know, what actually happens to pineapples? You know, is it hail? Is it cyclone? So we started to get a sense of how the plant behaved to the various weather events. And I often find that, and I didn't realise this, uh, but one of the big events is sunburn. When the pineapples get sunburned, they have to put sun cream on them, and that sun cream stops them, stops yield loss. So then we decided to wrap a product around it. And we said, OK, well, if it's going to be a hot day, anything over 35 degrees, we've got to have some form of payment. So then we started to talk through industry on that. So it was that interaction with industry that helps us design a product that makes sense to that community. And to me, that was one of the most important things, is that interaction where we can have that conversation. And events like this, in my mind, enable us to have that conversation so that it makes sense. So that covers make sense. I think one of the interesting things, and, and it always sort of, sort of gets under my skin a little bit, we'll always take insurance against you know, a depreciable asset like a farm machine, but we never take insurance against on a crop, whether it's there or whether it's not. But that's your asset, that's your ability to Take that asset. What you've got in the ground is your asset. If you're on broad acre, you've got two to three weeks of risk that people don't insure against it. Or there's not a market for it, or it's too expensive. 
So we have to explore the reasons why and then come up with something, a product that makes sense. And I think when you look at it, some of the products, dry and what Alistair said, he said, okay, it's going to be dry. So what does that mean? You know, is it going to be rain at the wrong time or no rain? Are we going to get another two, three years? As experts, we can only guess what's going to happen. We can only get an idea, you know, through the tools that we have today. But everything's changing. You know, we're getting a one in a hundred year event every couple of months. So the chances are that we've got to be prepared. We've got to start to understand what makes sense in terms of us to try and hedge our book. So what I like is that through a parametric product, we can build things. We can understand drought, extreme, heat, extreme frost, excess rain or flood, hail and cyclones. And some of the most exciting developments are starting to occur in the hail and the flood area. Um, when we look at some of the pricings for flood, there are no products, but parametric offerings are now providing those products. And we've got these little, little tools that are helping us to, to make these products actually work. So when we look at a parametric product, um, when we look at a policy, it's all designed around the data that we can find. You know, what is the data that makes it? Because through the data, we can then see areas of risk. We can say, well, to a farmer, do you remember, you know, in 2018, where we had a couple of days of excess of, you know, 50 mils of rain, or we had a season, we had a decile one, decile two event. So it's that data which is important because that data helps us to define the thresholds and the triggers for a parametric product. Parametric, you got it, parameters. So we're just dealing with parameters here. So we design it. So whether it's uh, the bomb weather station, the bomb grid data, the cyclone data, hail sensor plates. And that hail sensor plates, to me, you can't get hail cover in a lot of areas, but you can with the sensor plate. It sits in the paddock and a measure falls out of the, falls out of the side. What the NRMA ad says, uh, when the clouds stop throwing stones at you. You know, these sorts of sensors just sit there. And then when there's a vent, we can measure the size and the velocity of it. So we then tailor the products around it. Tail of the parametrics to say, well, if I'm going to get 10 centimetre, 10 centimetre hail, then I need to pay it because it's just decimated my, uh, my crop. These can all be done. And to an extent, they're quite accurate. With the QFF and the future drought fund, we'll be doing hail sensor trials for the last two years. And it's great. All the farmers get on when there is an event. We all get on and we all talk about it. And we all say, well, here's the information. We share the information so that people can understand that when there is a hail event, what does it look like? What does the reporting structure look like? All these things to try and design the right product for the right industry. And so far, we're quite happy with that, where we can see all the events that occur. Um, we're also interacting with the bomb, saying to the bomb, okay, well, if this event occurs, we had an event just a couple of days ago. Um, and we said to the bomb, what did you see? This is what we see. So we're reconciling that data to make sure we know that the hail the hail sensor plates actually work. To me now, the next section is flood sensors. When we talk about flood, it's very hard to get indemnity-based covers. Through intratech, through technology, we're now delivering. We're using satellites. We're using sensors. We can sense um, one of the particular ones. We have what we call flood base and, and flood flash. These are two international products that, that are starting to get the rounds. One, you've got similar to a, a sensor plate, you've got a flood plate, strap it to the side of the building. Flood starts to come up, see the water, trigger something to the satellite, the satellite, satellite hits it, comes back, and the server picks it up. We know how much rain or we know how much the flood has occurred, and then the payouts occur. The other one is remotely sensed through satellites. We can see when the floods occur. So if it's remotely sensed, we can then start to build a product around it. So it's a really exciting area, um, and, and it's all about being part of this conversation. You know, with Andrew, you know, at the NAP, he's got a loan book out there. He's saying, well, OK, is there a chance that if I use a parametric product to control that, could I reduce the cost of that money? Because you've effectively got a stop loss. To say, well, if I get a decile 2 event, I know I'm going to have a problem, but, hey, if it gets to decile 1, at least I've got income coming through. And to me, that is the important thing. So I guess during here, it's sort of a the test of any product is in its ability for people and farmers to understand and be comfortable with it. And these are the conversations. 
And this is one particular farmer in Moree. He's been using, we call them weather certificates, which is a parametric product. Um, 2019, using the weather certificate was absolutely invaluable. 100% of crop failure with a seven figure loss turned into a minor loss. Weather forecasts were not promising, and we used weather certificates to balance financial risk production risk to mitigate the worst case scenario. The bank liked the idea of a weather certificate and helped with refinancing. We used weather certificates for insufficient rain to grow a crop and hedge against yield loss and quality downgrades to chickpeas. Partial pay over the contract covered the losses. This is someone that gets a, an idea of, you know, that understands the value of these types of products because he's saving everything in terms of sort of getting that cash flow into his balance sheet. It's very hard to say at the beginning of the season, I'm going to allocate half a million dollars to something. What mechanism do I have to get that back if things go bad? Yeah, well, what, what do I have to recoup that to get my cash flow happening again? And to me, that's one of the most critical things. It's sort of, you know, how do I, how do I, or what can I use? And, and, and I think the tools are there to be used to be investigated. We've been doing it since um, 2012. Um, and on that journey, you learn a lot about what are the pitfalls, what are the good things, what are the bad things. And the project with the Future Strap Fund has allowed us to actually do a big deep dive, get the right products, get things moving. So here's another, another grow, WA. I would be able to offset some of my production costs, which have risen considerably. Now that's a big fight for a lot of people. Just saying, well, how can I manage that? The cover I took out meant that the downside to our financial position is not as poor as it could be. I can rest easier that financially, I can protect the downside, and more importantly, the effect of drought has on us personally. And to me, that's another thing. When you are at the farm table, you know, you are talking about a business and you're talking about how the business can be sustainable. And I think to me, that's the important thing. Trying to marry up a particular cover that makes sense and that's affordable. And that's the most important thing. So building farm resilience. Without a weather certificate or a parametric product, we can see the bad season. With a weather certificate or parametric insurance product, you can see the benefits. It enables you to recoup some of the losses that you have, and it enables you to be able to start again afresh. When we look at these products, it is about that interaction with the grower. It is about that discussion at the farm table, trying to understand exactly what's happening. And to me, that's the most important thing, having that discussion and saying, these are my risks. Yeah, you know, planning for the season. You know, have we got a, a, a low soil moisture profile? You know, uh, have we going to have problems with, uh, with irrigation in terms of the cost of water? You know, is it going to be hotter? All these questions, when you do your planning, your budget, your farm budget for the season, you look at the risk and you say, well, what am I worried about this year? Alistair will come out and say, this is the problem. Um, you know, Andrew will come out and say, this is what's happening to interest rates. Okay, they're my risks. I'm identifying the risks that I have. And if I identify that risk, then I can say, well, how can I mitigate them or what makes sense to mitigate? When we look at this, when we build in a parametric index, we look at the season. We look at the emergence rainfall, the establishment rainfall, frost, heat, excess rain, and wind throughout our whole season. And then we can start to sort of get an idea of what, where is my concern? We can, and we always look at, we can say, well, during the season, you can sort of have a look and say, gee, it's going to be a, a tight finish this year. These types of products can be purchased 30 days out from the event. So you can sort of have a look at it, be prepared, prepared to say, well, this is a problem that I might have, and, and this is something that I think uh, I can use. And then we try and price it up. To me, when I look at it, reduced yield from heat stress for canola is a big one. Canola is a huge market at the moment. It's growing, growing, growing. Downgrades from excess rain are also a huge one because within a three-week period on your harvest, you're susceptible to a 30 to 50% downgrade. So that brings a, a, a season, which could be a good season, into a scratch season. So these sort of products, particularly on the downgrades, are good. We understand in some products what the excess rain does. And as a producer, you understand how rain will affect your crop. So we design it. Design a cover built around an index that we pay for. In order to do this, the Future Drought Fund has enabled us to do a big dive. When we look at insurance, we like to say, 
does it make sense? Is this an insurance product that, that you know, that creates that return for me? Um, does it make sense? Because remember, insurance is all about not one payer. It's all about sort of managing cash flow over time. The bad year, you'll get paid. The good year, you'll be paying premium. Premium, bad year, get paid. Premium, premium, bad year. So it's all about managing that. And of course, yes, there is a, a cost involved in that, but it is all about managing your cash flow over time. We do an economic assessment, premium versus payout. A lot of growers say to me, look, if I pay this amount over this time, will I get this amount back? And we do that analysis to say, well, does it make sense to do it? In my mind, that's not a true reflection of what it's meant to be because we're reducing the volatility. But still, we put that in there because growers like to see it and then we take it. We look at the volatility of income, the average income in the worst years worth versus with and without, and the difference in the square root. So these tests are standardised tests we look at on insurance products to make sure they make sense. And here's one economic assessment. You can see here in some areas there's a small loss, some areas are beginning. But that's all about the weather, because the weather is volatile in other places. So when we look at those sorts of types of returns, we can say, well, okay, well, that makes sense. This was actually for frost. Some areas it made sense, in other areas it didn't. Premium versus payouts. In some areas it did, and in some areas it didn't. But mind you, this is over a 40-year 40, 40 period. So when you actually look at it and divide those numbers by 40, it's not that much of a difference every year. So in terms of that, it sort of makes sense. A low number here enables us to say it lowers your income volatility, which is what we like. And then we test for appropriateness, because a lot of people come to us with questions about Okay, let's look at the data. How can you trust the data? Is it the right data? That's what I say. Is this the data that I can use? Well, all these products are used, uh, all these product data are by independent providers like the bomb, and then we, we look at it. But the most important thing for us is to suggest, well, is the growers data similar to the bomb data? You know, and is there a basis for that we have to match? And we do that. Because a grower might have one station, weather station, two, three, four stations. We can easily grab access to his data. We grab the bottom data. We look for a correlation. If the correlation is high, it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, then it's not worth putting it together. <laughs> so we like to always think that, that when you look at data, make sure there's a high correlation to the product uh, that, you're, that you're using. So... These are the sort of things we've looked at, step-by-step -step tutorial on structuring an appropriate hedge, which we like farmers to look at. Understand the key, and one of our particular clients that have been using this, he said the most important thing is to be sure the key terms and what they mean. I've had instances where growers will ring me up the day before we have to start, and they say, oh, I've got to have it, I've got to have it. I said, have you read things? Do you understand things? No, I've just got to have it. They haven't done their homework. They've got to understand it. And even if they're at the beginning of the season, you sit down with somebody and say, I don't get it, I don't get it, I don't get it. Slowly it happens, slowly you start to understand it. Um, define the risk in the risk period. Most important, you know, we've had growers that said, well, okay, harvest. You know, I sort of, you know, I bought the product thinking, I said, well, did you understand that that was your harvest period? Oh, no. I said, well, well that's why you're covering coming, because it's your harvest. And give yourself a few days. If your harvest is going to last two weeks, Make sure it's done over three weeks or four weeks, just so you, you can be sure. Located in the correct location. We've had several farmers, they haven't even got the location right. So they've basically looked at it and said, oh, I like it, I'll buy it, because we've got the wrong location. Historical data. We take 100 years worth of data to try and make sure that we know that this policy works. A policy in these sorts of instances, people will say it's more expensive than a traditional farm like fire and fire and hail which comes in at about 3 3.5%, 4%. Think of it with a parametric product. You look at it. If it's paid once in every 10 years, it's going to be 10%, because that's how you do it. So you are paying for something. That's appropriate. And to me, that's the most important thing. We could price a contract, which is about 3% or 2%, but the return period might be 1 in 100 years. And that's fine. But is it appropriate for the risk that you're actually looking at? And we go through those. We
we define the parameters because the parametric product is all about the parameters. Tailing the parameters. You purchase the head, and you just track the progress. And through Intuit Tech, this can all be done online now. So you can check it. So by combining certain perils, we have growers that will look at things like a wet harvest, cumulative rain, rain days. We know for cotton, for instance, which is now coming up. We know if you can't get in the paddock, you've got some issues. We know that if the, the cotton gets wet or it sits in the bowl, there are some issues. We know that, that, that if you are sort of fortunate enough to have a summer and winter crop, then if you can't pick, it's going to delay your winter crop. So it's all these sorts of things that you look at. We can look at germinating. It's incredibly amount of different things that you can look at that sort of make the more of a risk that you have. So that's all I've got to say, and we'll do some query questions or okay. later on. You're on the panel. I'm on the panel. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Jonathan. Now, our next speaker is online with us. Um, it is Professor Shabazz Mushtaq from University of Southern Queensland in Toowoomba of the Centre for Applied Climate Sciences. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Just checking, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, first of all, my profound apologies. I wanted to be there, but things came up and I couldn't be there, but uh, it seems it's a really nice event and it should be lovely to be there. Um, thanks, I think I was going through all those presentation, very enthusiastic presentation and Jonathan, your presentation is really enthusiastic and, uh, and uh, some of the presentation that we have and uh, can I also acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Tom, he would probably be discuss a couple of slides. Uh, some of the, some of the, um, some of the agenda that uh, Jonathan has discussed is probably part of our presentation. So I'll probably skip uh, some of them. And also I'm asked to be very concise because we're running out of time. So can we have the next slide, please? All right. Um, the way we are understanding insurance is probably something, uh, insurance is a tool that will offer you payout after the end of a period. For example, uh, if you have a drought insurance and uh, for four months during a uh, summer period, and then once the period is gone through and then you measure the index and if, if the rainfall is below an index, then payout are triggered. And if the rainfall is above an uh, index, then you continue to pay your premium. But the research that we are doing, uh, and thanks for the assistance of the future drought fund, what you have access to insurance would it change your perception of risk? Would farmers would like to take more risk? So in, in other words, can insurance be used as a risk management tool uh, or a proactive risk management tool rather than a reactive tool that you get to pay out after a certain period? So our research that we have conducted here and, uh, and some of the research that Jonathan has done is also focusing on how insurance could be used as a proactive risk management tool. And the answer and the, and the further question is, would it allow farmers to take some additional risk? And then what is the value of that risk? Um, and we know that historically, um, in order to manage risk, that farmers have adopted some conservative uh, adaptation strategies, which may compromise on yield. But the question is, if they have access to insurance, could they take more risk? Could they plant in more risky window? Could they apply more fertilizer? Could they plant larger area? So, so here we have done some crop simulations, uh, which is uh, made of millions of uh, crop simulation, and we integrated crop simulation with the insurance products. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, uh, and also the next slide, please. Yeah, I think that Jonathan has already discussed the how the insurance would work, so I'll probably skip that slide in order to save time. Okay, here. Uh, Tom, did you want to discuss this one since this you have done this research, please? 
Um, so our our approach is uh, we use a process by models that we call the AppSim. So that we can simulate a, a cotton U in different scenarios, in different uh, uh, combination of uh, weather condition and management strategy. So uh, different management strategy is mean that uh, we combine different sowing days uh, strategy, different fertilizer application, different planting space, different variety together, different uh, harvesting day also. So approximately uh, we result in a about 4 million simulations for all of the uh, combination uh, of management strategy. And and then uh, from the uh, simulation result, we we test the uh, aggregation up for different sowing days, and then we uh, compute the uh, about three thousand index by insurance products. And our purpose is to see where the the uh, index uh, insurance products can help a farmer to select a a more risky sowing window to to potentially to have a a, a better yield and higher income so the the risk of taking that uh sitting days uh is will be covered by the insurance products uh we we do the simulation at the three uh cotton growing size as you can see in the map uh, in the map, it's Tyrol, Derby, and Golden Windy. You know, Windy. Yep. Next slide, please. So here is a uh, uh, a finding from the simulation. So you can see in the table, um, the number here is the difference in percentage between the sowing day. Uh, the planting day with insurance covers with in debt insurance cover and in the in the horizontal uh axis that is the uh planting day with no insurance so i will take an, an a number in in the green color there is say 20 21.5 percentage what does it mean the 21.5 percentage mean that if you grow in your cotton crop on 22nd October with in that insurance cover, it will give you uh, a higher income of 21.5 percentage compared to when you plant in your cotton crop on 22nd September without insurance. So that is how we interpret the results from the simulation here, uh, for example, in Golden Wind Day here. Next, please. Um, so, did they get a, a similar results we for, uh, we found for, for the another side, that be? And uh, next slide, next please. Uh, and then we split our research into a uh, another scenarios where we uh, take into account the trial years only. It means that uh, the previous uh, findings that is for all of the years we consider uh, from uh, 1942 to 2022. But here we split the data in into a, a trial year only. So. In trial year only, you can see that uh, the the different percentage in in the income can reach uh, up to 24.4 percentage in Delby in trial years uh, scenarios compared to the previous uh, when we consider own years that it can reach uh, the the different percentage is uh, is only about. Uh, 2.4 or 3.4 percent. So the result here indicate that with the in debt insurance covers, that is very uh, efficient uh, to cover your trial risk. Uh, that is uh, 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 
one one way to demonstrate that the 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 efficiency of the uh, index insurance and the advantage of using the the process by model simulation that we can take into account uh, different uh, weather condition and different uh, uh, management uh, strategy that we haven't performed before or we haven't faced in the past. And uh, so that will will uh, uh, will uh, provide a more uh, broad picture of of the uh, uh, how the index insurance can can be integrated into management strategy to transfer uh, uh, climate extreme risk. Yes, next slide. So here is the a uh, even. Uh, in uh, uh, Gundy we can see that the uh, in trial years, uh, the uh, insurance index can uh, increase your income up to forty eight percentage compared to no insurance covers uh, in some planting days. For example, you can see if you if you plant in your uh, your crop on twenty second September. Uh, sorry, um, 20, 22nd October with insurance cover compared to uh, if you plant in your crop on 8th November without insurance, you can see that the uh, different percentage in the income will be 48%. Yep. Next please. So, so here is uh, the uh, what we can learn from the, uh, the research is our, our theoretical framework uh, to combine the adaptation and insurance can improve the income stability. And this is one, a, uh, one of the innovative insurance options to, to assist in uh, upsetting the financial effect of extreme events. Uh, we Based on the modeling result, we can uh, select the optimal window to optimize our uh, crop yield and profitability. Uh, based on the simulation, we can design more affordable insurance products. Uh, and the result will help grow the sale resilience and performance in terms of product productivity and profitability and on South strength and the web and then social religion in rural and regional agriculture department community. Yeah, I think that's is everything. Uh, Shabazz, you want to clarify or explain uh, something? No, thank you, Tom. So just the message is that insurance could be used as a risk management tool and access to insurance would allow you to optimize your inputs and can allow you to take more risk and the value of more risk in terms of yield and income uh, is demonstrated in this case study. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> For the session before we move into the panel is Russ Mehmet from Willis Towers Watson, WTW. Over to you, Russ. Kerry. Smiling at Kerry there because I'm thinking it's late in the day. Uh, people are going to still hear for, about insurance. So that's, <laughs> it's a pity you, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a struggle. So I'll try and make it as interesting as possible because I come from a, um, a different angle uh, in that, yep, in that it's uh, very much what Jonathan has gone through thinking about the parametric approach. Um, so I'm trying to continue that theme on by looking at by looking at um, a different and alternative method of uh, risk transfer, as we call it, or insurance. Just looking at ways that might help the cost, the overall cost of insurance, um, and looking at potentially group buying power and uh, buying power for farmers and how that could add value. So my session is going to uh, touch on something called um, 
discretionary mutual funds. I don't know if uh, you've all heard of mutuals and co-ops. I'm sure that what I'm talking about here is insurance, mutual insurance funds. We call them discretionary mutual funds. And if you can picture, as we say there, um, it's an alternative risk transfer that gives group buyers and farmers the opportunity to buy uh, together and benefit and benefit from the group buying power. Very much how insurance started off right from the start, you know, in the uh, 12, 15, 1600s, wherever that was, those coffee shops in London, a group of guys got together on the marine side of insurance and said, we've got this cargo to insure each of us. Um, one of us won't survive, but if we all group together and pay part of it together, then if one of us goes, all won't go down. And we can contribute then to that one uh, cargo, um, one a cargo owner that has suffered. And that's the basis of all insurance. So the thinking is to uh, members contribute to a fund so they partially insure and have reinsurance sitting above the fund to protect should the fund become, and I'll give you an illustration in a moment, should the fund become exhausted at any time. Um, the, the fund itself is there to cover day-to-day -day working losses so that uh, um, that's where the potential to reduce the cost and all the um, insurance premiums don't all go to the insurance companies. There's uh, some retained in the fund, but with reinsurance protection above the fund, should the fund be exhausted. So it's not insurance, it's called discretionary uh, distribution of under a company or trust deed arrangement. The policy is, uh, the equivalent of a policy is uh, um, nominated, is specified through a constitution or scheme rules. Uh, Reinsurance, as I mentioned, is purchased uh, to protect the fund. Uh, losses in excess of the fund are met by the reinsurers. And an independent trustee, a manager, I mentioned this to Ian before, that there's a, a trustee set up independent to control and manage the monies belonging to the members within the fund. So here's a bit of an example. Uh, it's a, a, an actual works example that we've done with QFF. And the good thing about what we're doing now is we're working through as part of the future drought fund and a, a, a potential prototype for a discretionary mutual fund that if we will take, it'll be taken to government and the potential of starting up something for one particular crop which could then have application if it gets off the ground, particularly as a pilot, to other crops uh, throughout Australia. So if we can look at this, that's, this, this is, as I say, a work example. You can imagine a lot of uh, farmers contribute, uh, we call it contributions, but they're really premiums into that yellow part. So to pay for, um, this is just to explain to you, this was related to, for cane growers, in 12 different mill areas uh, that were exposed to cyclone in North Queensland. So those uh, farmers, a percentage of them who wanted to join, contributed to this fund, paid in a proportion, and if they had a uh, cyclone that exceeded a, a category three, category three or greater, and came within 50 kilometers of their farm, they would get a payout. The payouts were uh, in increments of $10,000. You could take out any amount, $10,000. $50,000 is what we use per payout for this particular exercise. So con contributing to the fund is uh, the cost to manage the fund and the potential payout uh, of one particular, one cyclone hitting in one year in one of those locations. The good thing about it is it's good spread, as you would imagine, up the coast. So if the fund got exhausted in the, due to a cyclone and all the amounts in the fund were paid out, then the, the two million in that arrow shows that reinsurers then take over and pay for the rest of the losses for that year up to $15 million, which was the limit that was regarded as an adequate limit for the worst possible scenario from history uh, for the number of farmers that participated in, the, in that we were using estimated number of particip uh, participating farmers. Anything about that, if it, if it was, you know, 
extremely, extremely remotely than it was they were self-insuring. But 15 million was regarded as an adequate amount. So that's the concept of the mutual. The big attraction, of course, is whatever doesn't get used in there, if a loss doesn't happen in any one year, those funds that are in there belong to the members. And they can be, as you can imagine, this hasn't been a, a cyclone exceeding three, a category three for a long time. So that fund continues to grow. Now, the challenge about this part and getting the funds for that is getting members to pay enough contribution to, to get to pay for the, pay, the managing of the fund as well as uh, uh, an adequate amount for payment of claims up to the total of $2 million before reinsurers come in. And so that's what we talk to the government, uh, Queensland Treasury, about capitalisation of the fund. Because let's say a million dollars was all farmers based on paying a reasonable premium were prepared to pay. We needed another one million from somewhere to capitalise that so that the insurers would sit over the two million because that's, that's where the best optimum value of the premium was going to be at the two million, as an example in this particular case. So this still under consideration. It's it's being talked backwards and forwards. Love the idea, but just not quite sure. One of the challenges, of course, is this is we put up a sugar cane. They say, what about other industries? But we say, get it going in one particular crop type, and there's the potential that it can be used by other crops anywhere in Australia. So that's being worked on in another crop type uh, nationally as part of the future drought fund, which we are going to be reporting on by June. That's a very quick flow chart. It depicts the uh, contributions from each of the grower farmers going into the discretionary industry discretionary mutual fund. Uh, that pays to uh, for accountants and legals, that sort of uh, outsourced service providers. There needs to be a, a discretionary mutual fund manager and trustee who handles the cash, as we talked about. Andrew, there needs to be. Uh, someone handling the funds, it can't, it's got to be a, um, we talked to Ian as well, it can't be us, for example, it's got to be a separate business. Um, reinsurance is taken out, and when a claim occurs, it's either paid out of the discretionary mutual fund up to the limit, the limit gets exhausted, then the reinsurers pay out the balance. So just a few uh, uh, benefits, and then, uh, some standout benefits, the biggest benefit is that what doesn't get used up in the fund, and there's insurers online, but insurers don't like that much because they don't get all the income, all the premium, and that's where they make their profits. Well, the profits from the fund belong to the members. The members own the fund. So anything, any successful years um, where there's a surplus, then that belongs to the members for different uses, not for going to buy we had one fund once where someone said, well, can I buy a car? Uh, I need a new new usual piece of a plant for my farm. Can I take some money out of the fund? And they said, no, no, no. And the trustees control that. The fund money is for the good of all. So if it's good risk management, that you know, bringing in um, new uh, risk management uh, netting or something, uh, that sort of thing can be used for the good of everyone. Or it can be put aside to smooth out the costs, reduce the potential reinsurance costs for future years, all that has the benefits. Um, I think I talked about surplus is the ultimate goal to reduce catastrophe the cost. See, the ultimate aim is to get the fund continued big, so bigger, so the insurance that sits above it, that bright part, there's, there's no longer 15 million, it might be 5 million, you know, just really upper it. So you're not paying a lot for the premium where the fund is itself is building up its, uh, its size. Um, Risk management, more risk management only helps the funds because uh, the fund, it's the fund's um, uh, exposure. So risk management helps the members of the fund. Improved protection, uh, really it's not governed by the insurance company you decide and that's where the, uh, the right sort of um, parametric cover is, is that suits members is what's taken out. Uh, they don't dictate altogether. Um, and claim service, just as Jonathan mentioned, because what that example I just gave you is a parametric type event cover, if Bond declares that's a Category 3 and above claim, then the $50,000 or whatever increment you take is paid out immediately to the farmers. So no delays, no 
inspection of what damage there's been, assess the delays, all that sort of thing. It's immediately dealt with. But just finally, participation, always the challenge. And really, the big thing, like any, again, Jonathan knows, it's um, awareness, education, particularly with something like this, because it's different to what they're used to. Um, and the biggest thing with any mutual or cooperative is there needs to be commitment. The people that are going to think about going into it have got to want to really do it. They want to, they've got good management with good leadership. So we want to be part of this and, and it's good for the collective uh, participation. That's vital. So proven product been in Australia for a long time. Local governments used it all over the uh, all over Australia, more than 30 years now actually. Um, overseas, a very common form of insurance in America, five mutual uh, out of um, yeah, so out of the 14 approved crop insurers, five are mutuals. And the good thing is they get 65% subsidised um, crop insurance. That makes it very appealing for them. But mutuals are a big proportion over there. Uh, in New Zealand, of course, there's the Farms Mutual Group, which has got 65,000 members, and that's a mutual. Um, same concept, really large, but New Zealand's always been strong on mutuals and cooperatives. Limited take up in Australia, CBH have got they're basically a mutual type concept apart from their corporate insurances, but they do have um, a receivables wheat yield type product, which is a basically that type of concept that they're using. Aussie Farms Mutual, you may have heard of some of you, might have been involved in that. I think it's still going, the old Lativo. I think it was uh, a different sort of a concept there. Carnarvon, the banana industry, they set that up 20 years ago. It went well. I think it's still going. And there was Farmers Mutual listed, but it became delisted. They just didn't have that capitalisation that they were was vital for them to build up their, their um, program. So finally, Australia's crop insurance market is very thin, as uh, Jonathan would agree. There's not this. It's your organisation and a couple of others, and that's it. So, and it just needs more activity, more pools of uh, farmers to participate in it to be successful. So, yeah, we believe, and that's why we've got it as part of the Future Drought Fund, looking at a, a, a prototype mutual and seeing what the appetite is going to be from government um, to, to get involved and show that it could potentially be commercially viable um, because uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic way of pulling, pulling back costs, challenge the insurance industry and, and widening out what is a very limited uh, crop insurance market. Thank you, Terry.